good evening from uh, from uh, New Sultan City. I think uh, I guess it's good everything from everywhere. Uh, Professor Smooth is in uh, is in Paris, so it's uh, a good afternoon to him. Okay, but uh, good evening. Uh, we are lucky today to have uh, Professor Smooth. Uh, I don't have to say too much when I just said Nobel Prize winner. I think that says it all. Okay, that's that's about all. Uh, it's a Professor Smooth is a, a visiting distinguished professor of Nazarbayev University, and uh, he has labs in Berkeley, in uh, Paris, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, at a university, and also in uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. We are uh, lucky to have him today. Uh, he won his Nobel Prize in 2006 for their discovery of the black body form of anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's, it will be given two talks, one to this right now, this evening, on gravitational waves, merging black holes, and merging binary neutron stars today. Uh, on Friday evening, exactly at the same time, 6 p.m., it will be given a talk on LIGO, L-I-G-O, and Virgo, V-I-R-G-O, gravitational waves, waves events, what new discoveries and interpretations. So this, I'm hoping that uh, we've invited some of our colleagues from across Kazakhstan, hope they are attending today. And uh, as I said, we are lucky to have him give us talk. He's a distinguished professor here. And uh, I'll, today he will give his talk and uh, Professor Yenaza Abdikamalov and Daniel Malarafina will have a, a question and uh, we moderate the question as answers after he finishes his talk. So thank you very much, Professor Smooth, for coming and giving talk to us today. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, you know, like to express my gratitude for the hands, chance to talk to people, even though I kept putting off this talk, because for the last few months, uh, the LIGO Virgo team has been claiming they would release data from Observing Run 3. And I thought, well, that would be great. The first talk can be the history, and the second talk can be what have we learned in this new situation where the amount of statistics has gone up by such a large amount. And Unfortunately, they only released the data about two weeks ago, and I'll show you a little bit about that. And it means my talk, the second talk will be much more technical than this first talk. I'm gonna try and focus on the history and the early discoveries, and then, uh, you know, on the next talk, talk about, well, what are we really learning now? Okay, so now I got to figure out how to share my screen. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah. Okay, sharing, and then yeah, sharing. Yes. Okay, I, I gotta go in, pre not presenter mode. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, good now. is it okay, or is the picture is cutting off the right hand side? No, I can see. I I can see everything. So. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. All right. So, um, I uh, I am a professor at Nazarbayev University, and also uh, the sort of the director shared with uh, Mikhail shared, shared with others for the Energetic Cosmos Lab, which is one of the high-tech labs. So what I'm gonna talk about mostly today is a history of gravitational waves. And near the 100th anniversary of the idea there are going to be gravitational waves, two colleagues of mine from Mexico and I, uh, George uh, Cervantes and uh, uh, Galindo, we wrote a brief history which is published so you can read that and find out a lot more. So here is now one of the new inserts. Hopefully this will work. This is basically appeared for the Day of the Dead. It's masses in the stellar graveyard, and it shows what was going on before we had results from LIGO, and now what do we see? Before we saw some neutron stars, and we saw some black holes that are called EMM black holes, those are ones that are detected electromagnetically. Generally, they're black holes with another star, a light star, um, orbiting around them or co-orbiting. And you can see the light star, and you can then see the impact of the black hole on the orbit and so forth. So that's how you were able to see the things before. Then LIGO came along. Well, let's see if I can get it to play again. It should have played twice. Uh, we didn't know much. The LIGO first run came. We ended up with three events. And then after the second run came, we had 10 events. 
now we have 62. Let me show you one more time, because I will spend a lot of the next talk explaining why this looks like it is and what are the stuff you can try. But you see there's a huge change that just happened two weeks ago. Okay, another thing that was notable is that in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to these three gentlemen, Renewal Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne, for their decisive contribution to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. And I'll try and explain why that was the case and then why we have to look more deeply if we're off into the next lecture. Okay, so even though some of us have heard rumors in 2015, that was all clamped down on and no announcement was made until February of 2016. And the executive director of LIGO at the time, David Rice, you know, announced that we made this discovery using the two detectors. And on the bottom right, you see a blue L-shaped one, which is the Livingston detector. It's in Livingston, uh, Louisiana. And the red detector in the upper left on the plot of the United States, uh, which is in Hanford, Washington. And the relevant thing is the orientation of the detectors and the fact that it takes light 10 milliseconds to travel across that distance. It's 3,000 kilometers. Okay, and then what you see on the left-hand side are the waveforms from the two detectors and a theoretical fit in a, as a white line. So the Livingston data, which is the bottom right one in the middle, shows this noisy waveform where you see this waveform rising in amplitude, getting faster in frequency, and then suddenly collapsing down. And the Hanford data, the one on the top in the sort of orange color, shows a similar thing. Uh, it's noisy data, increasing frequency, increasing amplitude, and then until finally it's, it reaches a crescendo and it falls down. And you take the two data sets and you shift the Hanford uh, for the direction you think the thing might be coming from, but to line it up, you shift it a good part of the 10 milliseconds and you actually invert it because of the arms and you see the two waveforms on top of each other. So that was the, that was the amazing evidence that got everybody excited. And that happened uh, in the data in 2015, and it was actually just before they were due to start the official run. They were in the engineering test runs, and everybody had gone home for the night. It was like one or two o'clock in the morning. And this event came in, and they declared that was the beginning of the end run, the beginning of the run, and that was good. We'll see why that is. Okay, so here is a simulation of two black holes, slightly unequal masses, orbiting around each other and distorting the fabric of space-time. The black hole itself stretches the space-time, and when it moves around, it makes a wavy motion in the space-time, and that wavy motion propagates out as an actual speed of light waveform. Now we've been able to test that it goes at the speed of light. Lots of things have happened with the discovery. So here's the Earth waiting for the waveform to pass, and they exaggerate it greatly, but the, the Earth is shifted in size in a quadrupole way, stretched in one direction, compressed in the other direction. And it went faster and faster and reached a peak and left. So that, here's a picture of the Hanford detector, it's in the desert. And uh, the, the wave was quite amazing. The, the fitted uh, masses were 36 solar masses for one black hole, 29 for the other. And when they combined together, they produce a 62 solar mass black hole with three solar masses worth of energy going out in gravity waves. Now the strain, which is a measure of the change in, in length over the length, was around 10 to the minus 21. That means in the four kilometer distance of the arm, the mirrors that are on the two ends of the arm move closer and further away from each other by about a thousandth of the size of a proton. So this is really a complicated measurement. This event took place about 1.3 billion years before that, uh, out at a redshift that's nearly a tenth, and then it reached the Earth, not until September uh, of 2015. 
and then they announced it uh, some you know some months later. So this was the the really you know news breaking event, and then we were nervous: will there be more or not? Because this was literally right at the beginning of the turn on of what was called advanced LIGO. There was a first LIGO that ran for five years, saw nothing. They made big improvements in the detector. And then when they turned it on immediately, they saw an event. Okay. So what are the stages of the event? Um, there are, the event is generally broken down into three stages. You have the two black holes orbiting each other. It's practically Newtonian dynamics. They just make nice circular orbits around each other. Their orbits get, uh, you know, circularized because it's emitting gravitational waves. And uh, as you get closer, you're in the period that we call the, the, the final part of the end spiral. And then when the two black holes touch, they merge, and then they have an odd shape. And so they ring down eventually towards a spherical or an elliptical shape, depending on how fast they're spinning. Okay, so this first detection, uh, I can't, this is a, a, a kind of interesting thing. So this first detection has a lot of really interesting factor to it. I put on the right-hand side, because at that time, that was when there were people who were voting on Brexit. So it was interesting to see that the black hole by, you know, orbiting pairs were roughly the same size as Great Britain. So anyway, if you look at these, the source distance is the, the, the 1.3 billion light years. The mass of the heavy one was 36 solar masses. The light one, 29 solar masses. The merged one was 62 solar masses. And the amount of energy going out in gravity waves was three solar masses. So three times the solar mass times C squared. And that's 50 times brighter than the total amount of energy coming from all the stars in the observable universe. So for very briefly, and you'll see in the bottom of the chart, you know, the time goes from, from 0.25 seconds to 0.45 seconds. It's a tiny fraction of a section but for a, sh a short fraction of a second, right? It, it is about a third of a second. It's the brightest object in the universe. And you'll also notice it's moving really fast, just at the merger. It's running, you know, the two are orbiting at relative speeds that are a little more than half the speed of light. So that's why it's able to do gravitational rays. You need to be very massive and you need to be relativistic. And these are massive relativistic objects. That's why they put out such a big signal. And they also do something that birders do, which is you plot versus time, the waveform, but you can also listen to it and you hear a chirp. That is the frequency is increasing, right? And you heard the first chirp that you heard was what it really sounds like. And then later it's shifted into the human hearing range in order for you to hear what the chirp looks like. It not only looks like, but what it really sounds like. Okay, so here's an animation of two black holes with a bunch of stars behind them. And they distort space time. And because of that, they create lensing and it looks like they're making the stars around them move. It's they're bending the light from the stars coming from behind them. And you're seeing that, but you're also seeing a special distance away from them, which uh, is related to the Einstein radius. And here they merge and it's run down and then eventually things settle down. So that's what we could have seen if we had them in a you know, great, wonderful telescope and we had uh, a bunch of stars behind them. That's what, what it kind of might've looked like. Okay, so let me go back in history a little bit because as I say, 1915 uh, was the first year of serious uh, attempt to forecast that there would be gravity waves. There was a long period of discussion about whether there were real or artifacts of the mathematics. And it turns out of the five kinds of things that were solutions that were found that people thought might be gravity waves, three of them were actually relevant things for gravity waves. So some of it was the mathematics, some of it was other things. And it took a long time for the theorists to agree there really were gravity waves and they really carried energy and so forth. But how did we know gravity waves exist? There's an indirect proof. And this turns out to be key uh, in order to get people out of the trouble that comes from the thing that I'll describe before. So 
Hulse and Taylor studied a binary pulsar for which they got the Nimble Prize in 1993. And it's, the orbit is sort of comparable to the size of the sun. You see in the bottom left a plot that there's two things orbiting with 1.4 solar masses each. They're neutron stars, so their size is sort of uh, 10 kilometers uh, as characteristic scale. And they're orbiting uh, in a fairly large orbit, and they're slowly radiating away some of their energy through gravity waves, and their orbit is coming closer. And on the right is the prediction as a function of the year of the, uh, the time of the, of the closest approach, right, the periastron. That is when the when are the two what is the time period when the two come together and it slowly drifts because there's energy being lost and it's slowly being circularized and there's a curve in there which is the prediction from general relativity and there are data points in there uh, which are data points from their observation and you will notice that that gap where the arrow points is 1993, they got the Nobel Prize. That ruined them for doing observations for a couple of years. It's very disruptive to your life, right? And the interesting thing is this orbital period is about eight hours, just under eight hours. So these are, these are going around each other pretty fast, but not as fast as the black holes do. They kept taking data eventually, and all the way up to 2010, and the data again agree with the British and General Tally very, uh, very well. And the change in the uh, period is about 76 thousandths of a second per, per year out of the 7.75 hours. So we had really strong indirect evidence here that gravity waves were being produced in a way that was predicted by general relativity now that the theorists have finally agreed on the way to do these calculations. However, that was important that it happened because of the work of this man. This is Joe Weber. Um, he was the first person to seriously think about it. He went to the conference in which the theories hashed it out and uh, Richard Feynman gave an example of why he thinks the gravity waves are real and can carry energy. He, he went at that conference, he decided that he should learn to try and do that. Took sabbatical in Princeton and ended up working there with, with Raymond Dice, a number of people, and coming out with what eventually became known as Weber bars. They're resonant frequency detectors. And in the early 1960s, he started claiming detections. And those detections then, when other people got excited and followed, you know, they, they were not, not so supportive and people were getting discouraged, but Hulse and Taylor's things came along. So here's Joe Weber in the lab, and there's his detector. It's this huge aluminum bar, it's almost crystalline. It has a very high Q. It's hanging by a cable, just not off where his elbow is resting on the thing to hold the cable up. And there are piezoelectric sensors. And you're trying to measure if this bar gets squeezed the way the Earth was getting squeezed and measure it very precisely. And this is a, a Chinese soap opera that says the concubine doesn't sing, I believe. But you're looking for something to come through right in the right frequency band, the 1660 hertz. That's the tuned frequency of that bar of aluminum. And you know, you, you hope that there are gravity waves in that band and you will, they will cause it to start oscillating and build up the oscillations and you will see it with your detector. And that was his experiment. And this is the same experiment as an opera singer with a glass, a wine glass, if it's got a high enough cue and she goes through the notes and holds the note at the right time, it'll break the glass. The same idea of the energy will build up in the, in the bar. Okay, so he had the first attempt. He got people excited about the field and studying it seriously. He really did make some serious detectors. And he also gave the first public lecture on laser physics. And he, with a student and postdoc, tried to think about using the laser interferometer to do it, but determined that lasers weren't ready yet for it. Okay, but some time passed, and in 1972, the LIGO design was kind of originated by Ray Weiss. So, Professor, I know, and one of the people who got the Nobel Prize, a professor I knew was a student at MIT, uh, and later on for other work. He came up with the idea of 
the laser or parameter detector because he couldn't understand how the Weber bar worked and he couldn't explain it to his students, but he could explain how a laser would. Now it turns out that two Soviets, Kirstein and Posovod, had come up with an idea of that in way back in 1962. And Vladimir Brzezinski had also revived it again in 1966. He didn't know about it, but some other people did. And so here's a picture of Ray, uh, you know, at the time uh, in his lab, more recent times. Okay, and there's a picture of him in the center when he wrote this in 1972 and the diagram. And it's not even in the paper. In those days, you could just send in a report to your funding agency and that was considered a, a publication. And so we still have all that information, right? And it did result from having to give a seminar. He took over a course that Steve Weinberg had been teaching, but then Steve Weinberg moved to Harvard. He took over that course on general relativity tried to explain the gravity waves and what Weber has done. He ran a seminar on the side and then with question of students came up with this idea. So students can be useful, right? And so if you look at 1972, it's not that he just revived the idea that people had had before. He systematically addressed a whole number of realistic noise sources and scoped out what scale and what sort of thing you'd have to do in order to build one that would actually work. And you know, I have a list here that he had to figure out the noise and the laser power, all this long stuff. He's the one at that time figured out that you need something on the scale of kilometers in order to make this work. And so he worked a lot of those things out in detail and that got uh, people excited about it. And he was uh, then in competition with uh, the Caltech group um, and they were doing it together in a certain way. And in 1984, the three people co-founded LIGO, Kip Thorne, Ron Drever, who, who died in March of, of 2017. It would, you know, he would have been one of the candidates to get it. Uh, anyway, there's more than a thousand researchers working in the LIGO Virgo teams now. And this, and, and from what they started with a small number of people. Okay. So, there is a picture of Thorne and Drever at Caltech, NYC at MIT, and a key people at the National Science Foundation agreed to fund them and uh, figure out how for them to, to start making prototypes and doing research and then do a, an, a study, which Ray Weiss and his uh, colleagues did, a study with industry on what it would cost to build something on this scale. And at the same time, these were reviewed by a set of people in Europe, most notably in Germany, but also these two gentlemen uh, who were in Orsa and Pisa. So the Germans had been, the, you know, sort of very dismayed, disappointed by the Weber bar results, and they had been working on them. And then they got excited by Ray Weiss's proposal, and they started to build one, and they built the detector, which is in Munich. But these two gentlemen uh, put together what now become the Virgo one. And uh, so there are, this, this is the only one of similar scale to LIGO. Okay, so in late 79, the National Science Foundation limited, you know, gave limited funds to Caltech and even less funds to MIT to develop laser interferometer. And uh, they proposed uh, this thing to the NSF in 1983 uh, and grossly underestimating how much they call. And things started in 1984, uh, but a number of problems developed and you can read about them and so forth. But fortunately in 1994, Barry Barish, who was professor at Caltech, replaced the people who'd replaced the other people, <laughs> I haven't been successful, and became the PI and director to lead the collaboration to success. So the first operation started in 2002 and ran 2010. That was over five years of observation. Then for five years, they were shut down and upgraded. And in late 2015, in September 2015, Advanced LIGO began operating and immediately started making discoveries. And the cost up to that point is 620 million US for that. And the Virgo is somewhat less in cost, but it's on the same scale. Okay, so the Hanford facility is on the steps, is the desert area in the Northwest part of the USA outside of Hanford, Washington. 
the Livingston facility is in the southern swampland, Louisiana. It's kind of pine forest and water. And uh, there, you know, so the, the land looks really different, but the layout of the instruments look very similar. In practice, Livingston has actually started after the initial phase. Livingston has been performing better. You might see that in some of the data. A laser beam is split and sent down a pair of long perpendicular tubes, each precisely the same length. The two beams bounce off mirrors and recombine back at the base. The light waves come back, lined up in such a way that they cancel each other out. You add them together, you get nothing. You get a zero, a big fat zero. No light gets detected at the photo detector. But when a gravity wave comes along, it distorts space and changes the distance between the mirrors. One arm becomes a little longer, the other a little shorter. An instant later, they switch. This back and forth stretching and squeezing happens over and over until the wave has passed. As the distances change, so does the alignment between the peaks and valleys of the two returning light waves. And the light waves no longer cancel each other out when added together in the recombined beam. Now some light does reach the detector with an intensity that varies as the distance between the mirrors varies. Measure that intensity, and you're measuring gravity waves. Well, they make it sound really easy, except you realize that something smaller than a proton or the nucleus is uh, much smaller than the wavelength of light. So you're getting a very small variation. You're having to do this very precisely, and you have to worry about laser noise. You have to worry about many things. So I have another one. In an interferometer, a laser beam is split into two beams. Mirrors reflect the beams, so they meet again at a starting point. If now the distance to each mirror is exactly the same, no light will be seen by the detector. The waves of one beam extinguish those of the other beam. This is called interference. A passing gravitational wave distorts space, making one arm slightly shorter and the other arm a little longer. The light waves do not cancel each other anymore, and we now measure a tiny signal in the detector. Now we add an extra mirror in both beams. In this configuration, the beams bounce hundreds of times back and forth between two mirrors before returning to the beam splitter. The intensity of the light in these so-called Fabry-Perot cavities increases substantially. The cavities boost the interference effect a few hundred times. The sensitivity is further increased with two additional mirrors, which recycle the outgoing light into the cavities, and with a so-called mode cleaner, which removes disturbing noise from the laser beam. The light power in the cavities is increased to hundreds of kilowatts. Even more complex optics and electronics are required in order to keep the mirrors properly aligned and in position. Ground vibrations at most about 100 nanometers are nevertheless millions of times greater than the vibration caused by a gravitational wave. Therefore, all components are mounted on horizontal and vertical vibration attenuators, the best in the world. While the ground is trembling, the mirrors and beams feel nothing of it, thanks to the super attenuators. Also, air presents a problem. It gives rise to unwanted vibrations, such as due to sound. Poor so-called cryogenic traps provide an ultra-high vacuum quality.
we can pick up hundreds of times more signal of a gravitational wave by extending the fabry perot cavities to three kilometers. This and much more is needed to realize an interferometer for detection of gravitational waves. Okay, so it's actually a little more complicated than, you know, the first video, even the second video simplified things a little bit. So going back to this waveform, which now looks so, so ratty, you know, when you just look at it, you know, it's actually an incredible achievement. It's just, you wish the signal noise was even better because that would allow you to determine more things. So this event was a gold-plated event. And uh, so you couldn't have asked for much better for your first event. Okay. So here's another video to show you what it looks like. So the black things are the black holes. And then below that is a 2D distortion, a version of a 3D distortion of space time. You can see the potential wells for the black hole. You can see where things would free fall. And these things are orbiting. And this is, you know, four tenths of a second before they emerge and so on. We'll go down, we'll slow down as we get closer. And you will, you will note that they're distorting space and time and they're twisting it around. And the signal you see is actually at twice the frequency of the orbit. As they get closer and closer, slow it down. This is the last 200th of a second. And you see that the wells are getting closer and closer together and they eventually touch. When they touch, you will see there are two black regions. There's the black region in the center, which is dark black and a gray area. There are two horizons and the first horizon merges and then the final horizon merge and then the thing rings down and you get a single, in this case, elliptical because it's rotating uh, black hole, but it's close to, to the spherical. Okay. So um, here the waveforms blown up more carefully and that's just so you can see them a little bit more. You'll see there's two curves on there. There is the data itself and then there is the fitted data, uh, you know, fitted by using computer models using what they call numerical relativity and reconstruct uh, 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 either a wavelet or a numerical relativity fit and you compare those and see how they look to your data. And by having only two detectors and the only thing you know is the difference between the peaks, uh, the time of the peaks, then uh, you can realize there is a, a circle on the sky from which the source could have come from. These gravity wave detectors are actually quadrupole antennas. So there are four directions that are picked out, but one of them picked out more strong than the other because of what's going on. So you see what would be a circle on the sky, and then you see a region which is the most likely region from where, where it came. But this is a really big area in the sky compared to what astronomers with big telescopes can look at. And that's, that's a frustration, right? But things were coming on. So the two big working detectors were Hanford and Livingston in the United States. There was the German detector, which was only 600 meters long, and the Virgo detector, which was behind schedule during the shutdown, uh, which is three kilometers long instead of four. And eventually Virgo came online, and that becomes important in a little while. And then Kagra is supposed to come online this year. It was running a little late because of the, the COVID-19. And then in another uh, four years, LIGO India is supposed to come online, and those are relevant to increasing sensitivity and re re increasing you know, time coverage of the sky that some, most of the detectors will be up at some time. Okay. So here's what's going on. If you look at this plot, in the center of this plot, there is a red sphere. That's where the original LIGO could see, detect uh, you know, gravitational waves from events out that far. When advanced LIGO first run came on, it could see onto the gold circle. And when it's finally upgraded a lot more, we should go out to uh, the blue circle. And there has been an upgrade between runs two and three. And that's why there's so many more events in run three, even though it's not any longer than run two. And uh, so you see further when the sensitivity improves by a factor three, 
you see nine, you see 27 times the volume. So that's why you gain so quickly by making detector improvements. Okay, so after that event happened, this cartoon appeared, right? It said, oh yes, the sound of colliding black holes is still being repeated. And it shows these guys with a telescope. So you know they're astronomers, but gravity astronomers don't actually use telescopes. They use those interferometers. And the joke, of course, is the guy in the background is pounding on the wall, but this guys think he, they're hearing it. Well, it turned out the day after this cartoon showed up, there was another event. 1.4 billion years ago, two black holes performed a cosmic dance. They spun around one another, coming closer and closer together until finally they collided. This dance created ripples in the fabric of space and time, also known as gravitational waves. In December of 2015, those gravitational waves reached Earth and were detected by an instrument known as the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO for short. Scientists with LIGO announced the detection of the two black holes on June 15th. This is only the second time that scientists have ever directly detected gravitational waves. The first detection, also made by LIGO, was announced earlier this year. Currently, all other telescopes and space observatories study the cosmos by collecting light or other particles. But the black holes detected by LIGO are not expected to radiate light. So by looking for gravitational waves, LIGO is illuminating otherwise invisible sectors of the universe. For space.com, I'm Cala Cofield. So that's one of the ads for uh, gravity waves or for NSF for funding them. Okay, so here's the data from that. And you can tell it's noisy, but they saw it for a longer time period and both in Hanford and Livingston and fitted the waveform. You see many orbits and then you see the coalescence and ring down. And this one was the, you know, sort of 40 solar mass, 20 solar mass, making the, the kind of result. And again, the same sort of thing, going a little faster than this half the speed of light is just before they coalesce. And uh, there were in that run, you know, three candidates, two confirmed detections and one possible detection. Uh, there were the first three events from the first observing run of, of LIGO. And uh, you can see charted up the most massive ones on the top line, the second most massive one on the second line, and the least massive ones on the, on the bottom line. Now, next lecture I'll talk about how the ones at the bottom are not a surprise, but the ones at the top are kind of a surprise because we've seen black holes whose masses fall in the lower range. We haven't seen them before in the higher range. And I'll skip over some of the events. So how do we know what we saw or heard there? I mean, when you looked at the plot or listened to the chirp, right? Listen to the actual data. And you can see the best fits for what they said was 16, but it was 15 in December, 2015 in December. And uh, uh, you can see the best fit there and below it the best fit. And you see the time in seconds, right? Going from minus two tenths of a second to zero, basically. And then you can see a theory of what you would get if it was binary neutron stars, which is what LIGO was originally designed to be able to be sure to see because we knew binary neutron stars existed. Pulse Taylor and Pulsar binary pair is not the only one we know. So we knew some estimate of how many there would be and what would be going on. We didn't know how many black holes there would be at the time. We had a better idea, but it was still not in what terms of what people are seeing. And compare the difference in the frequency. The neutron stars are smaller. They can get closer together before they emerge. Therefore, they can orbit it at a higher frequency, even though they're not any more relativistic, they're just much closer together. Okay, so here's what happened during the first observing run, right? You know, there's the first event immediately, that is they actually 
literally a move the beginning of the observing run up and uh, since they found a candidate and then again in October they found one and I was kind of expecting one in November but they didn't see anything and they saw one just after Christmas in December and none in, in the first part of January and then they shut down to make some upgrades of which the the Livingston upgrades succeeded, but the Hanford one didn't fully succeed. Okay, so here are the here are the three events, and here are the locations on the sky. Right, some are located a little better than others because of signal to noise and and because of different aspect angles. But basically, it's a section out of a great circle, and some places they go much wider than others. Now that's why it's relevant. But if you had Virgo, then it would be localized to a much smaller area. That's why it becomes critical to have the third one in because now you're doing time in between three objects and you have crossing circles and you can look for an overlap. And there's another deja vu. There was another event that appeared on September 17th, now 2017 when they're back on. Hanford, you can see the signal on the top left, Hanford in red. You can see the signals there, it's not super strong. Livingston, whose sensitivity improved quite a lot because the new laser or new other things were successfully installed. And Virgo, which was running later, but also hasn't had as much running time and debugging time. And you can see that in the bottom line too, you can see the waveforms and the red is the noise and the middle one, the blue is the, the detector noise. You see oscillating around with the waveform. And then you can see the Virgo waveform with more noise. But it's critical, even though you can barely make it out, because you have all three, you have the other two, you can do coincidence and see they're okay. And the three of them together help you localize that source much better. So here's the Virgo detector. It's in the Italian farmland near Pisa, Italy. And it's three kilometers long instead of four. And it's still an earlier development stage. But it actually made some of the advances in the in the uh, isolation towers and so forth that contributed back to the to the LIGO side of the house. Okay, so the yellow banana is what LIGO would have said for that event, and then the green and the purple are when you add in the LIGO first in first quick look and then in actual detail analysis. Those are the areas which how well you were able to tell. It's still not great. It's still ten degrees on the sky but it's a lot better than being this huge stripe on the sky. Still difficult, right? And so we finally do have this event in the bottom, in the bottom left of the, of the sky chart that shows a fairly narrow uh, kind of, uh, of position on the sky. So this was important to show that it worked and it localized because there was another thing that happened. Oh, and then now we have, you know, five known uh, black hole uh, events. Plus we had the, from the X-ray studies, uh, the known black holes with white dwarfs or other things orbiting around each other. And you can see there's starting to be a difference uh, between them, but we'll, we'll get to that in a later lecture. Okay, so here's another thing that's relevant. On the bottom is the frequency of the incoming gravity wave or just frequency of the, what the device you're using to measure. And on the other axis is the strain noise, that is the delta L over L apparent shifting of the mirrors back and forth. And you can see the blue curve at the bottom, the light blue curve at the bottom. That's the goal that they're going for. And uh, the darker blue is the goal they were going for in the next run. And uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's another thing. And above that, you see the two LIGO detectors. And above that, you see the Virgo detector. It's Life is a lot harder because you have actual resonances in your equipment. One of the things you have a resonance in is in the mirrors that are bouncing the stuff back and forth. The mirror itself is kind of like a big crystal and a big piece of glass. And uh, uh, it, it has natural modes of oscillation. And you have lines. So when you do the data analysis, you you try and study those lines, you have to figure out which ones are inherent and which ones by making improvements in the apparatus you can get rid of and so forth. That's why it takes a while from when they first turn on to when they start can 
get rid of some of these places where there are resonances of noise and make things move down. But you can see they, they have pushed LIGO very hard to go to lower frequencies because they didn't expect these high mass black holes. Originally, it was designed to be good in the range from 100 to 500 hertz, which is where most of the signal from neutron star, neutron star collisions would appear. And here's the improvement over time. You see that Livingston did make this upgrade. It's able to push to lower frequency. Hanford had to take off one of the improvements, and so it didn't get quite there. And then Virgo, when it's stepped up mode, still has many resonances that it needs to be getting rid of. So it's, it's a very complicated thing that's going on. And when they do the data analysis, they actually have to remove these lines from the data and then read, you know, subtract them and then redo the fit and so forth. So it's more complicated than it looks on the surface. Okay, so now we've got gravitational wave astronomy, which has been going on for a while, but now one of those has succeeded. That is, the ground based interferometer succeeded. There is proposals in now, there was at the time only one proposal in called uh, LISA, LISA, Laser Interferometer and Space Array. Uh, there is a group of people who are doing pulsar uh, array timing. As you find an array of pulsars and you measure the time of arrival of pulses and look to see if there's a systematic shift that would be caused by a gravity wave passing through the system. And there's also the cosmic microwave background, which can show up. And particularly people are interested in the primordial gravitational waves, but there are a number of ways gravitational waves can show up in that. And the frequency at which you're able to make detections varies from very low frequency down to the range around 100 hertz. And so the ground-based interferometer is at the range of 100 hertz is, is what's going on. And you'd see the strain, as you can detect, is much smaller at the low frequencies. But the energy turns out to be uh, also roughly comparable on all these things. So it's, it's tricky whether you're doing strain or in terms of, of the energy that's floating around. And there are different ways that people are thinking about this. And with the discovery, everything is a lot more exciting. And since that time, not only Lisa, there's now two, two uh, competing proposals going forward in China to build laser ferrometers in space. And we'll have to see what's going on. But the, the European Space Agency is the main push behind Lisa at the present time, but we'll see how things develop. Okay, so the interesting thing at that time of the discovery, uh, Elisa was having meetings and so forth, and uh, Albert Sana rushed out this paper that said, look that first event, if Elisa had been up and looking, it could have observed it for the order of one to 10 years and be able to predict a week ahead to, to within a week of when it was gonna merge and eventually to something like 10 seconds of accuracy in one degree, just by observing it for a very long time in, uh, you know, from, from uh, the LISA, you know, space array, you can predict when it's going to show up and be observed as a chirp in the LIGO bands. And so this has gotten people more excited and more work has been done in that area. And so now people are confident. The question is, how soon will a gravity wave interferometer get up in space? And uh, so there are various, you know, estimates that people kind of do for what kind of signals should be existing in which kind of bands. The one thing about the LISA kind of band is you expect to be confusion limited. That is, you expect to see large number of sources and you just separate them out by their frequencies and by what part of the, you know, figure out which part of the sky. And there are proposals for other kinds of interferometers to go on. But we'll, we'll have to see how things develop, but there's a big effort now for people thinking about what the next generation detectors will be. And there's astrophysical implications, and I won't go too much into this because I'll try and talk about it more next time. But it's clear that LIGO is seeing something that appears to be uh, an uh, yet unobserved population that is unobserved by other astronomers uh, and by the electromagnetic bands of heavy stellar mass black holes, that is things heavier than about 20 solar masses. And uh, I'll show you a event here next week, 
a next uh, lecture, an event that's up around the 80 solar masses uh, kind of scale before merger, right? And 160 after merger and so forth. And so the question is, where do these black holes come from? How do they fit in current solar theory and so forth? And one of the things is there's some events appearing in what's called a mass gap. Stellar theory predicts there's a gap between neutron stars and black holes, and also a gap between black holes and intermediate mass black holes. And now there's question because LIGO is bumping into both of those. Okay, you can also do tests of general relativity, right? You can, the binary pulsar is a limited test as a velocity that's roughly 10 to the minus three, the speed of light. But with these events, we have strong field, nonlinear gravity, and high velocity regime, that is velocity around a half. And there's no evidence for deviation for general relativity so far. But as more data come in, it should be more and more precise. And when we get lucky and we see a really nearby event with very high signal noise, we're going to be able to tell quite a lot. Okay, so why is it important? Okay, well, this is the first direct, direct detection of gravitational waves, a theory that had been around for 100 years and was the last large remaining prediction from general relativity that there will be gravitational waves and that they'll propagate at the speed of light. Now we're trying to test more and more precisely how close the speed of light it is, because there are modifications that would have the speed of light and the speed of gravity be slightly different. It's the first observation of a black, of black hole binaries, something that we speculated there would be, but no one had an idea. They were off at least a factor of 100 from the rate that would appear to be showing up. And you know what about these more massive ones? These are the most luminous astronomical events that have ever been detected. It's a new window here. So this was a big deal. It's not a surprise that a Nobel Prize would get awarded for this because it's generated a whole new field and a whole new set of research things. And it links back to other areas and has impacts on other areas. Okay, so it's a new, you know, the colliding black holes, a new area for astronomy. But that wasn't all that LIGO ended up doing. LIGO's hits just keep on coming. After its first detection of merging black holes, swiftly followed by finding three more and then a Nobel Prize, the pair of gravitational wave detectors has made yet another huge discovery. On August 17, 2017, the observatory detected gravitational waves from two neutron stars spiraling together and merging. Just two seconds later, a so-called gamma ray burst was detected by NASA's orbiting Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope and its Swift Space Telescope. 12 hours after the wave was detected, a team from Las Campanas Observatory in Chile reported a new glowing optical source in galaxy NGC 4993 that was consistent with these findings. And with the advanced tip from LIGO, both radio and X-ray emissions were found a few days later, coming from the same neighborhood. Not only is this the first time LIGO has detected gravitational waves from a neutron star collision, it's also the first time that electromagnetic observations from conventional telescopes accompany the gravitational waves. At wavelengths ranging from ultra-short gamma rays to very long radio waves, the event was seen by observatories around the world. Because we now have visual information to go along with the gravitational waves, new discoveries are being made about the nature of neutron stars. The light coming from the collision showed spectral traces of lanthanides, a group of heavier elements towards the bottom of the periodic table. This strongly suggests that merging neutron stars have been responsible for the creation of heavy elements such as gold and platinum, a long-held theory. Not only that, but the shape of the gamma ray burst was unusually weak. Gamma ray bursts are usually so strong that researchers assume that the gamma rays emerge from two back-to-back -back jets that shoot out of an explosion like narrow spotlights. The weaker gamma ray burst suggests it was produced when broader jets slammed into a cocoon of matter surrounding the merged neutron stars. While this finding is home to a lot of firsts, it won't be the last. Researchers are positive that with the large amount of gamma ray events out there and the increase in both gravitational and electromagnetic detector sensitivity, we'll be seeing a lot more of these combination events in the future. I have another one just because it's pretty, it's got nice For the music. first time, astronomers have detected a single cosmic cataclysm in both gravitational waves, ripples in space-time itself, 
and electromagnetic waves, what we typically call light. This hugely collaborative effort includes the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave observatories, along with a multitude of telescopes in space and on Earth that together collectively monitor the full spectrum of light. The spectacular event was produced by the collision and merger of two neutron stars. These objects are the burnt out remains of giant stars that have exploded as supernovae. They leave behind cores of exotic matter composed primarily of neutrons crushed together under the intense pull of gravity. More mass than our sun is compressed into a sphere that is about the size of a city. Astronomers have long known that neutron stars are found in pairs, orbiting one another. The theory of relativity predicts that the motions of these incredibly massive objects should generate gravitational waves. These waves would drain energy from the orbiting bodies, causing them to slowly spiral together and eventually collide with each other in a spectacular explosion. On August 17, 2017, gravitational wave CHIRP was recorded by the National Science Foundation funded LIGO observatories, and less than two seconds later, a short burst of gamma rays, a high energy form of light, was detected by NASA's Fermi telescope. Researchers quickly realized these two fundamentally different types of waves could have come from a single neutron star merger. If so, it was critical to identify exactly where this had taken place in the sky, and if the explosion could be seen by other telescopes. The Fermi data indicated the burst came somewhere from a patch of sky covering about 1,200 square degrees, an area equivalent to 6,000 full moons. Adding information from an independent gamma ray detection from the integral satellite, the search area was further reduced. The LIGO observatories placed the source somewhere in long, narrow strips of the sky, one of which overlapped with a target patch. The Virgo Gravitational Wave Observatory in Italy, working in conjunction with LIGO, should easily have been able to detect the signal of the strength, but saw almost nothing. This was an important piece of the puzzle, since any gravitational wave observatory has a small number of blind spots where it cannot detect an incoming signal. Restricting the source location to Virgo's blind spots further narrowed the search area down to approximately 28 square degrees, or 144 miles. Around 50 candidate galaxies were identified in this area for follow-up observations using optical telescopes. Less than 11 hours after the first detections, astronomers using the Carnegie Swope Telescope identified a previously unseen blip of light in the outer reaches of the galaxy named NGC 4993. Several independent confirmations were reported from other telescopes over the next hour. The first ever optical counterpart to a gravitational wave event had been found. Knowing exactly where to look, Astronomers began an unprecedented campaign of follow-up observations using more than 70 telescopes around the world and in space. During the course of the next two weeks, the neutron star merger was detected across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The gravitational wave data have, for the first time, provided a direct measurement of the masses and orbits of a neutron star pair before their collision and merger. The data also enabled ongoing follow-up observations across the electromagnetic spectrum characterizing the explosion and revealing how such unimaginable events have played a formative role in shaping the world around us. These results, for the first time, confirm that neutron star mergers create precious elements like gold and platinum, as well as a host of other heavy elements all across the periodic table. Explosions like these, through our cosmic history, have seeded the universe with the materials that later would form new stars, new planets, and beings like ourselves who look up and wonder. So, you know, those that, that was the original reason why, you know, how LIGO was designed to be sure to be able to detect those kind and prove that gravity waves existed directly. But it's led to much more than that because now we're starting to see the rate and we're starting to see the large number of black holes. But the neutron stars are in some ways to astronauts is more interesting. There's two branches. If you go off in one direction, the black holes, you get to study some fundamental physics and test relativity, information theory and so forth. In the other direction, you're able to test nuclear physics and a bunch of very complex stuff that you have a neutron star is much more complicated than a black hole. It has not only the, the, the neutrons and mass that it's in it, it has magnetic fields, it has a lot of other things. And when they merge, there's leftover material, and that allows you to see the, the light from it. So here's another simulation of a 
what was uh, people were making their career of, of calculating accurately the binary merger. Uh, of course, I have two of these. And, uh, but you can see there's a kind of an atmosphere of, of neutrons, electrons, and protons on the outside of the neutron star. But they merge, and they throw out a lot of material, some of which forms an accretion disk, and some of which forms two back-to-back -back jets. I don't think the simulation shows the jets. But, so you actually have a whole set of structure. Plus, you have a residual object, which is probably the rotation supported neutron star, which then collapses to be a black hole. So here's the other one, I think. I'm trying to remember which one has both the beautiful of music and the beautiful pictures. This is the one that has the nice music. So it's a similar calculation. You can see the atmosphere is the neutron stars affecting each other and being shot out as debris in an accretion disk. see an accretion disk, you see, um, you know, uh, atmosphere, you don't see the jets, they didn't do the, the jets. There. So it's, uh, these are what we call, the, these kind of collisions end up producing what we call short gamma ray bursts. And this was followed up by many observations, seeing it over all the different wavelength bands from the gamma ray x-rays all eventually down to the radios. And generally, you see the lower frequencies later because the whole thing is expanding. And then as it expands, it gets bigger. And it's easier to see, especially at the longer wavelengths where the resolution is good, the angular resolution is good. And uh, it also cools, so the other, other frequencies die away some. And so you, you, uh, you have this idea on the left and then the picture on the right, which doesn't you can't resolve that, but you do get to see what kind of thing you think might be going on. So we got a lot of masses in the stellar graveyard until three weeks ago. This was basically what we saw. Now we have six times as many. And this is the more detail from that. The, the, the one event that's been seen clearly both in gravity waves and in electromagnetic We'll just skim through those because we're running out of time. But just to show you, there's plenty of data that shows the gravity waves and then shows it up in the x-rays and the gamma rays. And then eventually some. So that's the binary neutron star merger and then the, kind of the end of the story. And the interesting thing is that this might be the source of a lot of the very heavy elements. And in fact, you know, we can tell the funding agency we know where they can find like three solar, three Earth masses worth of gold if they want to go get it. So they're back to observing as of April 2019, and they've improved the detector, and they should have, you know, continued on at the rate of picking up about five uh, findings a month. And that's sort of what's been going on so far. And as Kagra, in the second half of, of observing on three, Kagra should come on the line too. So this would be even more pieces of information. So I think I will run to a conclusion here because we're running over. But this is the plot that we're going to talk about a lot. 
on Friday. And so I'll end at this point because I'm running over and we want to have some time for questions. Oh, I stop sharing. Okay. Did we have questions? Thank you so much, Professor. That that was uh, very well, impressive. You learned something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, I think uh, I think uh, Yenaza and uh, Daniel will moderate the questions, the question and answer session. Yes. Yenaza? So yeah, I'm, I'm Daniela Marafarina. Uh, thank you very much for your very nice talk. And I'm here reading some of the questions from the people that were listening. And um, the first one uh, uh, is a bit general. Uh, one of the attendees is asking, uh, thank you for giving a talk. It would be great to know, great to know your reaction to the 2020 Nobel Prize. <laughs> the 2020? <laughs> well, I know, I know two of those fairly well and one of them in passing. And so uh, I think it's great. And uh, you will notice that the 2020 Nobel Prize also is highly related to black holes, as Roger Penrose, who uh, developed the mathematics and the idea behind how do you prove that general relativity really does predict there'll be black holes. And in fact, almost all generic gravity theories will prove you know, proves that there'll be black holes because when you get a certain point, you get trapped surfaces and those surfaces have no choice but to go, to go down. And then he later on went and proved with uh, Stephen Hawking a number of theory of theorems about, uh, you know, the behavior of black holes and so forth using that same kind of stuff. Uh, Reinhard Gensel uh, has, has actually came from Berkeley and he was a quarter time professor there, has been a quarter time professor there. And his office is next to my office. And we occasionally overlap with each other <laughs> in our offices. And so I know him quite well. And so I, uh, you know, I am quite, I know he's been working on this black hole, uh, you know, proving there's a black hole in the center of the galaxy. It falls in a different category of black holes. You know, we, we, we have the black holes that we know exist which are the stellar mass ones. The, the heavier stellar mass ones that, that uh, the LIGO-Virgo uh, collaboration is telling us about. And there's been long speculation and some candidates for what we call intermediate black holes, things above 100 solar masses up to 10 to the fifth solar masses. But then we know there are super heavy solar masses, uh, you know, super heavy black holes in the center of all, essentially every galaxy. And we believe that their masses go from the 10 to the fifth up to 10 to the eighth uh, solar masses, depending on how big the galaxy is. And in our own Milky Way, there is a massive object which is uh, on the order of a couple times 10 to the sixth, that is 2 million to 3 million solar masses. And what Reinhardt and Andrew Getz, Reinhardt Getz and Reinhardt Getz, their two teams observed stars that are orbiting in near this object and then showed that at least a couple of them are nearly relativistic and they come, one of them is elliptical orbit, it comes very close to the black hole. So, you know, so close that if it was a, not a black hole, it would be, you know, it would be a problem. There would have been a collision or something. And so, they have really effectively shown that it's a black hole. And uh, we're not surprised. Our big surprise is how did they get to be these supermassive black holes? That's a, one of the big mysteries is where did they come from? How did they come into existence? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I may add that maybe it's very exciting times to actually study astrophysics and cosmology because not only because of the prizes, but because of all these new discoveries that are coming. Right. I, I knew it was exciting because of the discoveries. I didn't know that the Nobel Committee would give this many astrophysics cosmology prizes in a row. It's not quite in a row, but it's quite a lot if you look in recent times. So we have a question from uh, the Mohammed, which is a bit of a personal question probably, but I believe it may be interesting for many. Why did you switch from mathematics to physics during your study? Is it because mathematics are not nominated for a Nobel Prize, he's asking? <laughs> Actually, 
being nominated for a Nobel Prize was never high on my agenda. It's something that happened way after I did everything and, you know, and I was moving on to doing other things. And um, so it wasn't because of that. I liked both mathematics and physics, but I found my talents, that my intuition and my talents were better suited to physics than it, than it was to just doing the math. After a while, the math became, uh, because I was ended up somehow getting more into the applied math and more of that sort of, that I, I just found physics sort of more interesting, exciting, and I could easily get into graduate school and get a, a research assistantship or, you know, uh, I, I could get supported. I could, I could uh, you know, pursue my studies and, and get paid for it. Not paid a lot, but I got, you know, I could live that that life. And so that's, it's, it's partly my own inherent interest and abilities, and it's partly uh, circumstances. Uh, thank you. And if I may add, I think most people that work in these kind of fields, they don't do it for the reward. They do it for the pleasure of uh, the job, of the discovery, of the excitement of the science. No, I um, think that's true. I think it's very, it's, it's a, I feel very fortunate that I have to live through a time in which science has been well supported. And, you know, people, I particularly got a chance to do experiments that weren't in the mainstream and yet led to things that were interesting results. And so I, uh, you know, I think that I was very fortunate to be able to do what I did. Thank you. So we have also one question from uh, Galim Jean that is wondering if the expansion of the universe, does it affect the propagation of gravitational waves? Does the universe decelerate the propagation of gravitational waves? He's asking. Okay. So, the effect that the universe has on gravity waves is very similar to the effect it has on light in that if you have a binary black hole orbiting each other with the masses and you look at them from nearby, you will see they're orbiting at a certain frequency and the gravity waves are coming towards you with the frequency that's twice that orbital frequency. If you move them away to where the they're at a distance of a redshift of say one, to make it easy, so one plus z is equal to two, then you will find that the waves get stretched just like the white waves get stretched, the gravity waves get stretched, and their frequency goes to be half. So if I observe the, a, a, the uh, gravity, the binary pair nearby, I get a very strong signal, then its frequency is twice the the orbiting frequency, but if I put it at a redshift of one, I get a much smaller signal because it's much further away, so it's whatever the distance. But I also get it at a lower frequency by the, that factor of one plus z, e, a factor of two. So that if I'm looking in the detector, instead of appearing, say, at 200 hertz, it appears at 100 hertz for that, that particular orbit or whatever. And so it, it, uh, the, the, the expansion of the universe just has basically a time dilation effect and it makes the distances, you have to be careful about calculating the distances, but if you're in relatively small redshifts, like most of these guys are claimed to be at 1.1, it doesn't affect things too dramatically, but it's 10% lower frequency. And uh, you know the, the, the distance is pretty much linear with the redshift for small redshifts, so it, it just scales with the distance. So it is uh, the, the gravity waves have the same kind of, in the general relativity, gravity waves have the same kind of coupling to space-time as the photons do. And so anything that happens to photons happens to the gravity waves too. Now, you can ask yourself, which we'll talk about a little bit in the next lecture, what about, can gravity waves have gravitational lenses the way photons have gravitational lenses, right? We have, we have plenty of cases where we see a source or a galaxy far away, and we see it through the edge of a cluster of galaxies, and we see it magnified or stretched or whatever it is. Can gravity waves happen to them too? And the answer is yes, almost exactly the same way. And uh, it's only in somewhat modified versions of general relativity where people have added some terms of general relativity that you actually see it's slightly different for light than for gravity waves. 
So this actually relates to the next question that is from Ruslan that wants to know, well, his question was pretty long, but to summarize it, uh, how close is the speed of light and the speed of gravitational waves as far from what we know uh, from the detections? Okay, so now it depends on what you want to assume. But one of the things you can do is you can look when you have the three detectors or the two detectors and you see the time delay. And if you can got some independent, like either the third detector or in this case, the optical, you can then know the direction and then predict what the time is. And that tells you the gravity waves are moving, you know, within a few percent of the speed of light. That's not enough. However, if you take that neutron star, which was observed many times in different electromagnetic bands, you can look at the time delay between the arrival of the gravity wave and the arrival of the gamma ray burst. It was about two seconds. Okay, well, two seconds is, seems like a long time, right? But you have to allow for the fact that it takes some time for the thing to collapse and for the the relativistic jets to go come out and then to create the signal. But neglecting that, if you just take that, I forgot how far away it was, but it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's about a hundred million light years. So if it was a hundred million light years, that's 10 to the eighth light years, and you came two seconds apart, and there's 10 to the seven, pi times 10 to the seven. So it's roughly the same speed to a part in 10 to the 15th. So the speed of gravity waves and the speed of light, if you think, you know, they're only two seconds apart, right, and they should be simultaneous, then they have the same speed to a part in 10 followed by 15 zeros, right? And uh, it should be tighter than that because there should be a delay between the two of them that's on the roughly that scale. And so you, you have evidence that the speed of the gravity waves is very similar to the speed of light. Now, what you're hoping is you'll find some events from further away and you can measure the time delay between the photons and the, and the uh, gravity waves, you know, with at least as much accuracy or better. And you have a much longer distance, so you get a, a tighter measurement. But still, that's telling you they're very close to the same speed. You're, you're still, if you have a viable theory, it's got to predict very close to the same speeds. And some of the ones that are that way are ones that has to do with how much of a gravitational field is the light moving through and how much of the gravity waves moving through. There would be a slight difference between them. But in the otherwise empty space, they should be very similar. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, now maybe I will abuse a little bit on my privilege of asking questions and I will ask my question. That is from the measurements that we have, you said that uh, they confirm that general relativity works. But uh, can we actually see uh, some hints at the geometry? Can we actually measure if the geometry is well described by the geometry of black holes? Or we just see the general relativity works in uh, some uh, uh, approximation? Okay, so there, there are papers, I haven't read them all carefully, I've looked at some of them. There are papers that talk about measuring the waveform in the ring down. Because once the two black holes start to merge, when they first come together and touch, then in a common envelope, then you're in strong field general relativity and you should be going, you know, you should have oscillations. And you could, this is for the people who are worried about, you know, is there, a, is there some kind of censorship or some kind of thing around the black hole? to prevent you from getting to, you know, into the information of the horizon and so forth. There's a lot of things like that. These different models that try and avoid the, the, you know, the, the issues of general relativity, they can be tested by looking to see if there are other modes or strange modes excited and so forth. So we're already testing general relativity to the point where we know that just like Newtonian physics was very good until you get the very high fields or very high uh, you know, velocities and so forth, that, that general relativity is going to work until you either get to cosmic scales, uh, there might be some addition, or to get to ultra strong fields, because now we're probing, we're, we're actually seeing these large black holes 
merging with each other. And if Lisa gets going, you will see it much more precisely. And then the quantum, the quantum information kind of question. So general relativity is holding up more well than anybody had to believe, you know, any reason to believe, except it's a really beautiful theory. And uh, but it's been it's been the reigning theory for hundred years, right? Only Newtonian physics that lasted longer than that. <laughs> and it eventually was supplanted. Not that it was shown to be wrong, it was just shown to be wrong in the regions we hadn't tested it in, the, in these strange cases. And at some point, people think general relativity will break down somewhere, but we don't know whether it's going to be in the really small scales or the large, super large scales, or it's going to be somewhere. But maybe, you know, it's just holding up really well. And so I, I think, you know, people will keep trying. But I think it's actually pretty hard to break general relativity right now. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice answer. And uh, switching to another question more related to society, Feli is asking, I'm not a scientist, but uh, I and many other people in my position find these studies very fascinating. Nevertheless, non-scientists like me often wonder what are the implications of these findings for planet Earth. Could you say something about that? Is the overall objective just to understand the universe, or could these findings have more direct implications for our planet? Okay, so it's it's hard to know from what direction uh, he's coming or she's coming, um, and the fact is, one of the things that we have learned is that we explore science for several different reasons. One of which this like might end up being cultural, which is where do we come from and how does it all fit together, but we also have found that the most important discoveries have come out of what we call left field, you know. And I have a couple of examples that I give of that. That if you, if your job was to find a way to help medicine to be able to diagnose patients and to be able to do stuff, would you look? Would you fund someone to do research to see if high energy particles came from the sun? Well, the answer is no, of course not. Doesn't seem to be related, right? Well, it turns out Rentgen decided that he would answer that problem. He was a professor in, in Germany and he would do that. And so he did very careful work and he discovered that x-rays and in his paper that he published in 1901, got, you know, early Nobel Prize for this. He, I think maybe the first, um, he included a picture of his wife, Hand, with her wedding ring on, and you could see her bones through her skin. A month after that paper was published, they had an x-ray machine in the Berlin hospital. And the result of that is we now have many different kinds of devices, the, the CR, you know, uh, the, 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 not only the x-ray, but we also have nuclear uh, resonance and, and other kinds of devices where you can look inside a patient without cutting them open. That now allows robotic surgeons or surgeons working with robots to do surgery on a person without cutting them open, but just going through a hole, a small hole and running the thing down, being able to measure how precisely where it is, and doing the surgery inside without cutting the person open and withdrawing the surgical equipment. And those people recover from the surgery extremely fast because you didn't cut them wide open and so forth. So it's an example of a discovery that clearly had nothing to do with medicine, but it had everything to do with medicine because it's directed with the medicine. There are several other examples that, that I have for medicine, but another example is the discovery of the electron. Do you know in the, in the original model that economists had of, uh, of the US economy and the world economy, there was one slot for electronics and electricity. It turns out that more than 65% of the world economy fits in that one box right? because the discovery of the electron, you know, what could that be, right? How now led to stuff that revolutionized our life and during a pandemic makes it possible to give a remote lecture like this. And so the reason you do measure, you do observations to flesh out all of science is because things that you think are completely unrelated sometimes make a discovery of some process that can then be flipped over and applied to a different field and revolutionize it. And we just have example after example of that and what's going on. 
Now, there is the other effect, which is a cultural effect of science, that if we sort of know how the MRS works and what our place is and how things go, it gives us, you know, sort of an idea of who we are and how we fit in the whole universe. Thank you very much, Professor Smith. Uh, so I will just close the, the Q&A session here and uh, pass the word maybe to Anton if he wants or, or, or provost to, to close your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Smith. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We'll see you on Friday. My honor, thank we'll you. See you on Friday. Okay, thank okay, you. okay. Bye, have a nice evening. Bye. Bye, yeah.